Good evening and welcome everyone to the second uh, town hall meeting on our new library. I'm Michael Harris, a member of the City Council and one of the Council representatives on the Library Task Force and Steering Committee. I'm here with my fellow uh, committee member, uh, Council Member Sue Nowak. I want to welcome you and uh, give you just a very brief introduction to what's happening this evening, then we'll turn it over to our architecture team. How many of you were at the last town meeting? And how many of you are newcomers? Well, we're glad to see both of you, both the new ones and the ones who are returning. And I, I think you're going to be in for a very interesting evening, learning a little bit more about how the progress has been going on getting to the point where we actually have a design for our library. And now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Sue Nowak. I'm not really sure this deserved two speakers up here, but because um, we're only really doing a brief uh, introduction. But um, as you all know, many of you know that we're here at the initial town hall meeting back in November. Uh, our architect firm, uh, I'm just going to call you guys BCJ because I, I mess it up every time, uh, and Margaret Sullivan Studios have been doing a lot of work and a lot of public outreach since that first town hall meeting. I think uh, 12 maybe uh, focus groups. Um, all different, whether it's school-age kids, whether it's the um, story time folks, senior center, all over the place, trying to get the best understanding of what Pleasant Hill is, what the Pleasant Hill Library is, and what people want to see in the future. So uh, we had a meeting yesterday, went through a lot of this information in the steering committee, and we're thrilled to see what's come out of it and what, what um, this, um, our firm's our consultants here have come up with. So uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to them and uh, please just participate as much as you can tonight. Uh, the more you participate, the more we get out of it. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. I'm David Andrini. Um, that's, that's me two or three years ago before I decided I was too lazy to shave. Um, <laughs> and um, I am the, I'm with Bolin Switsky Jackson. It's at the top there, BCJ. And we're in San Francisco. We're an office where we have about 45, I think, in San Francisco. And we have five offices around, around the country. Um, all about the same size, we're a little bit smaller. So we're a pretty small, pretty small, pretty decent sized firm. Um, I'm here today with, um, with, uh, with Michael Cross and, and Carl and, 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 uh, and Annalisa. And then our consultant team, Margaret and, and Maddie. And why don't you guys just Introduce yourselves and share a little bit about what you've gotten out of this so far. Or... Okay. Sorry. Yep. Hi, I'm Margaret Sullivan. It's, so, it's such a joy to see so many familiar faces, um, and it's been a joy even to meet some new friends tonight. Um, but as David mentioned, um, Margaret Sullivan Studio is a design firm that specializes in reimagining and programming the library of the 21st century. And as a big part of what we do is we design libraries for the unique communities that we work in. And a big part of understanding the unique communities has been this process that we've engaged in with you all um, to understand your value system so that the library can align with that. Um, so I'm just thrilled that we're able tonight to share with you um, what we've been learning and um, it's going to be a fun session, so thank you. Um, I'm Maddie Oric, and I work alongside Margaret. Um, and I'm here um, to learn more about you guys. And I have been learning a lot about you guys and sort of um, translate all of that into what your perfect library can be and make it very Pleasant Hill. Um, and it's been really a joy to get to know it. Hi, I'm Annalisa Pitts with Bolin Swinsky Jackson. I've been sort of the point person on our team for some of these programming efforts, so interfacing with Margaret and Maddie. Um, and what we've been trying to do over the last couple of months is really get to know what makes you guys tick as a community, why you love Pleasant Hill, and to make sure that your library really communicates those values and helps you carry that forward um, and you know, build new capacities in the new building. Hi, I'm uh, Michael Cross. Uh, I've been with BCJ for over 10 years. Um, I live over in Albany, um, so I'm really excited to do a project here in the East Bay. We've done work all over the world, and actually in the 10 years, this will be my first Bay Area project, so I'm incredibly <laughs> excited. Um, 
Yeah. So uh, thus far, I've been working a lot with city staff, um, city planners and engineers, trying to get started on uh, some of the site planning characteristics that we'll be faced with. So as programming finishes up, we're really going to start launching into getting getting the program laid out on the site and moving into building design. So um, it's been uh, tremendous so far. We're, we're super excited, and I hope you guys can sense that from us. Um. Uh, good evening, and thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Carl Backus, I'm principal with Bowen Swinsey Jackson. Um, you're probably going to uh, want to see um, our proposals for design for the new library, but um, I, thankfully we've been selected as a um, design team, and I think some of our uh, promotion as a good uh, firm to work with you was a history of listening and learning before we start designing. And I think we've learned quite a bit and heard quite a bit over the last few months. I don't think we're quite finished, um, but we will begin design soon. Um, I'm glad that Michael's going to get a chance to work in East Bay. I would say that we have had a presence in East Bay. Um, our firm got uh, our local presence by doing Pixar Animation Studios. We've worked at Mills College. Uh, we've done two buildings at UC Davis. So even though we've got an international presence, we're really proud of the work that we've done locally and look forward to uh, showing you some designs in the coming months. Thanks. Some of you might have been wondering, well, where are the other two? Um, these are our landscape architects. Um, uh, and they're you know, really fantastic um, site designers. Um, Sarah is out. There's a you know there's a nasty bug going around, <laughs> so she's not with us today, um, nor Rebecca. But um, I think the conversation today isn't really going to get so much into site design. Um, but the next time that we all get together and we have a town hall meeting, we'll we'll begin exploring design opportunities. For those of you who may not be familiar, I'm sure just about everybody knows where the site is at this point. But just a little refresher: we are adjacent the new library will be at the site that's adjacent to the existing library. Um, next to the, the creek, which is represented in blue, right? And we think about, you know, as we, as we get in, the reason, part of the reason why we, we have um, Sarah and Rebecca joining us really in the process is, and, and um, especially also um, with Margaret and, and Maddie, is our, we, we, we believe that the most successful designs come out of a, a really in-depth understanding of, um, of people and, and place and, and the community and the place. You can't really separate those two. You, you, know, you need to understand the place, understand the community, and the community understand the place. So together we're sort of going down this, this, this bit of this adventure. We've been on this listening campaign, as, as has been noted. And that's the list that we've gone through on the right thus far. Um, uh, well, they're not all focus groups. Some of them are, well, we had a town hall community meeting here um, two months ago, and then we do meet monthly with the library staff, which has been really a wonderful experience. That's the group up on the upper left up here. And uh, the middle school teens, they were, <laughs> Mark was going to do that a little bit, they were a lot of fun. Um, Eco Studio, the Maker Steam groups, Carrier groups at Storytime, I mean, the list just goes on. We also had a lot of fun at the um, Light Up the Night event. Um, we set up a little booth, and we engage with people and ask people to fill out a survey. We've also had various other kind of survey opportunities for, um, for outreach. We've been, um, we have uh, some forms at the library that people have been able to fill out. Um, we've had, uh, and we have a presence on the website, so people can leave their comments. We've received about 30 comments thus far on the website. So we're trying to reach out in any, you know, in any way we, we can think of, really. Um, electronically, in person, in small groups, and big groups. Um, the sampling here, I mean, last time it was, it was about double the size, but I mean, it's a sampling of the community, right? I mean, not, not everybody can be free but between, you know, 7 and 9 p.m. So, so we, we're trying to find as many opportunities as we can to make sure that our, our listening is as um, diverse. So as Carl mentioned, where are we? You know, some people are coming here maybe hoping, we, this is a question we keep <laughs> we keep hearing is, you know, so when do we get to see something? <laughs> When's the design happening? And it's coming, I promise. In fact, for us, it's kind of a challenge. We have to kind of really try to 
to not put on our designer hats because we don't want to prejudge what we hear. Um, you know, it, it, it can really influence the way you perceive things. So we are in the phase of the project right now. I'm just going to run through it real quickly, just give everybody sort of a broad idea of how the process works. So we're in a phase we call programming, not to be confused with library programming. That's a, it's a different thing. This is space planning programming. And, and this is part of this, this listening campaign is to really understand the activities that the library should support, the values of the library. And it works in a, you know, the, the outcome of this is both quantitative information, how many square feet for this, how many, this kind of room, how many staff do we need to support? And it also comes in qualitative information, which is a little bit more nuanced. It's the character of the place. Does it want to be vibrant? Does it want to be um, calm? You know, these are qualities that take a, you know, they're a little less easy to put on an Excel chart, <laughs> but just as important. The outcome of this process is going to be a program document, which is gonna, which we're just in the process now of starting to condense all the information that we've heard, and Margaret's going to give you a quick overview of how we've gotten there, and then the result will be this document that will support the design process, that leads us forward, which takes us to the next phase, which is then we begin schematic design. We call it schematic design because we're, we're thinking very conceptually, and we're exploring different options, and we're thinking about broad concepts, you know, the form of the building, the orientation of the building, where does it sit on the site, what spaces are next to what spaces. Um, what is the character of the space? And once we've gone through that process, and that, that, that's, that's one of these town hall meetings, we'll be, we'll be coming back during the schematic design phase and sharing, sharing with you at that point what, what, what the concepts are that we're recommending. And then we go into this phase that we call, sorry, I keep, <laughs> uh, design development. And design development, really, at that point, we've, We've decided, we've, we've, we've determined during schematic design that, for instance, we may, that a certain room needs to have carpeting. Well, this would be the opportunity, design development is when we decide what kind of carpeting. And, and we get into some nuances with that. Uh, what kind of tile? And, you know, we may say, well, we want a wall of windows, a schematic design. Design development is where we decide, determine what, precisely what kind of windows are they. Are they metal? Are they triple glaze, double glaze, et cetera? Then we move into actually documenting the project so that contractors can take the drawings and bid it and then we do the technical specs. There's a lot of detail that goes into these drawings, so it takes a bit of time. Lots of coordination. We start layering on, making sure everything is coordinated between the different um, consultants. And then we get into the construction, bidding and then construction, obviously. So that's the, the, the big arc, and, and we're way up at the top still. <laughs> I think we'll... Pass it on to Margaret. Okay, all right. Good to be back. Um, you all know, now about half of you all have had multiple conversations. So the only thing I request of this um, town hall meeting is that you all interrupt and get into focus group tone because I want this to be relaxed and casual. Um, and I'm looking forward to showing you a little bit about the methodology that we use and how we um, created a synopsis of meaning, purpose and meaning. But also, um, I was explaining to some of you all when you were entering, think about the program as the recipe in the cookbook. So it's the recipe of items that you gotta go to the grocery store and get, but we haven't started the cooking yet. So that's a good way to frame what a, what a progr building program is. Um, so I have to tell you all that this has been one of the most extraordinary experiences of our career because we have never had this amount of public input in a library programming process of we travel the world, um, not the world, but well, we do travel the world <laughs> for fun. <laughs> But for work, most of our work is national, but we do go to places like Cleveland and Salt Lake, and we're doing work in Las Vegas. Um, we've done work in our hometown of New York. Um, I've done work in my hometown of Greenville, South Carolina. In all of those places, we've not seen the outpouring of community effort and input. And also, the I have to give um, props to um, all of the folks that are at the city and the county and the library level 
administration level because they've worked so hard to organize these community meetings and focus groups. And it's just an amazing, amazing effort that really speaks to what an amazing place Pleasant Hill is. And you all told us that. You told us that. It's not like I'm not telling you anything you didn't already tell us. But now we know what that means. Um, and the spirit of volunteerism, the spirit of community empathy, um, that's what's going to be the foundation for your Pleasant Hill Library of the future to flourish. It's already flourishing, but when you get a new building, it's just going to be magic. Um, so I'd, I really want you all to know how, um, how moved we have all been in this experience to see what a great community you all are. I mean, you all know this, right? I'm not telling you anything you don't know. Um, some things that we heard you all say um, when we talked about what do you want this library to be and to feel like. Striking and welcoming were two of the words that rose to the fore. Comfortable, um, but then also tap into creative, innovative, provocative, fresh and fun, timeless. That's always a good word. Um, the flexible and adaptable piece is also critical. Um, but surprising and inspiring and also sustainable. So do these words resonate with you all? Um, so what, what this is for Pleasant Hill is really where we're starting to go to. The Pleasant Hill Library is an interesting, it's one piece of a larger county system and that county system is a great support and platform that has a mission um, that the, the library is the pulse of the community Together, we spark imagination, fuel potential, and connect people with ideas in each other. And what our methodology is, is when you have a county system, like you have a Contra Costa, um, where there are individual cities, or even when you have a county system and there are multiple branches, communities have character that is truly unique um, in their own. And we don't, we're finding that for many reasons, um, because technology, because the way we distribute books. You all probably um, get books from all of the link, right, of link and the fact that, how many of you all get your books and materials by placing them on hold? Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> so even that has allowed the <coughs> flexibility of, of libraries to not need to be what I call the rubber stamp. It doesn't have to be the container of equity. You can actually have your own character and flavor. And so what we're um, interested in is determining what that character and flavor is for Pleasant Hill. The other thing um, is, and I'm not going to ask you to read every word. Uh, this is a diagram that shows, a diagram that we use in our office to, um, to illustrate the 21st century human-centered, customer-centered service model um, that you, we are designing the experiences around people and not books. Um, so a lot of, you'll hear that the library is about the community, not about being a warehouse. I'm sure some of you all have heard that definition. Um, and so the way we diagram that is at the top, the library is designed to foster the strategic goals of an institution. And it does it through creating experiences that have brand characteristics or brand qualities. We're going to describe those in a minute too. And then these experiences are activated through the spaces and places. There's your recipe. Um, and then they're supported or enabled by the tools that include the people, the skills and talents, the partnerships, technology, program equipment like green screens and 3D printers, and books. So some of you all have said, where are the books? <laughs> so the books, think about it at, like your home and the way sometimes in your bedroom you have some books on the bedside table and in your library you might have a ton of them and in your living room you might have two or three that are like your you know, coffee table books. So that's the way we're starting to think about the 21st century library. And I, I see Patrick nodding. So. <laughs> cookbooks, in cookbooks in your kitchen. Cookbooks in your kitchen. Sorry, and I have to remember I have. To. We were intentional about, in the work effort that we engaged in for the past few months, really understanding what the strategic language means for the Pleasant Hill Library. 
and not just that the library is the pulse of the community, but reflects the energy that we already know is like a galvanized amazing force. Um, and that we want a place that will spark the imagination of the community through all the amazing innovative programs and having spaces that are designed for imagination to flourish. So the 20th Century Library um, was designed to be the warehouse for books, to have reader seats that equaled the quantity of reader seats that you had in the, count in the city next door to you. Um, and potentially with a multi-purpose room that was at the vestibule next to the restrooms that was cut off from the library, right? So how do we design spaces that foster community by mixing and matching so that the staff, when they're doing these amazing programs, aren't like fighting with the building all the time um, to, to create the experiences that will do achieve these strategic goals? And how do we fuel the potential of all the users? and support innovative programs and ideas and activities um, like the Eco Studio. How many of you all have been to one of the Eco Studio programs? It's just the project-based learning experience is just amazing. And that Eco Studio experience could not happen if it weren't for the amazing volunteers in the community that helped to activate it. So we wanted to understand as much as possible about what it takes to make that program successful so that as we design the, the recipe that we're considering that. And also, I mean, you all know this, but libraries, librarians, and the way we are engaging are just so different than the way that we have traditionally understood libraries to be, um, whether it's cooking or making music or dancing. Um, at story time, or even doing outreach in the community around healthy eating. So libraries are changing. And so when we get to what are the values of Pleasant Hill, um, I always say we, we design libraries, we start with words. So we started putting some words together that we saw as uh, experience, what we call the experience principles. Play, storytelling, invention, iteration, curiosity, connection, collaboration. Does that sound like Pleasant Hill? And I think one of the words that I was thinking too earlier, um, authentic, as being something that describes Pleasant Hill, but I think inclusive is also a characteristic of this place, a real value system. It's not, you know, we, we learned it's not just play for the little ones, it's play as a avenue to learning for all ages and stages. I mean, storytelling, right? Y'all, Pleasant Hill Library thrives at storytelling um, in all of its vibrant forms. And I think one of the things we were hearing was that there was such a um, great opportunity to not just enjoy storytelling as a recipient, but also to come to the library to create your own stories through multimedia platforms. Invention, the spirit of invention. And I think it's not just about invention, inventing things, tinkering in a messy maker lab, but it's knowing that you're going to the library to invent your own future, your own personal future, at all ages and stages. But then it's also a place where you can go and play with VR, and play with circuitry, and play with making new stuff. Um, iteration, um, I had fun with this, create, cultivate, craft, and contribute. I was really all about the C's. Create, cultivate, craft, and contribute, and launch ideas into the community. And I was thinking of um, the, what, the Night of a Thousand Inventions, have, did any of you all participate in that program at the library? Tinkers and thinkers, and that's in the that's what it turned into in the community. Uh, yeah, out in the park. Okay, so what I liked about that story is that Patrick and his team developed a program of the Night of a Thousand Inventions that was in the library, and then as it got more and more successful, partnered with Rec and Park. I have to practice saying that here, and it became the Tinkers and Thinkers Festival-like event or event, um, and so it's. 
it's not, it's, the library is not a place that owns. The library is a place that launches in the community. And that's that spirit. That's a very um, specific spirit of Pleasant Hill. And I think that also creates a character of place where you know that this is a place of tinkering and making and launching and creating and failing forward um, as well. Curiosity. Um, is the entrance to creativity, um, but there's a commitment to discovery, learning, and exploration, and the commitment to connecting with each other, connecting to opportunity, connecting to aspirations. Um, but connect, social connections was one of the most important characteristics that we heard you all say the library is, and not just social connections among peer to peer, but the, the intergenerational opportunities that you all have to connect with each other in the community flourishes at the public library in ways that it does in another um, institutional experiences in the community. And then collaboration. It's not just, as we heard today, the need for collaboration for high schoolers for four to six, um, or the need for collaboration among the young startup entrepreneur. It's the fact that you are collaborating to make um, Pleasant Hill an extraordinary place. You, you all believe that as a, and that's that spirit of volunteerism and the commitment to each other. Um, so we did a surge diagram. We recognize one of the one of the key aspects of the design that we will consider ongoing, it's not solved in our recipe, but it's something that we're careful to acknowledge, is that um, you all, we call, it, we call it surges, have surges throughout the day that we want to be keenly aware of as we develop um, the spaces and place, the, the, how the recipe gets arranged. Um, and these are just two quick diagrams to let you know we're paying attention to this because it might come, we thought it might come up as a question. <laughs> um, but one of the ways, one of the techniques as library designers that we handle these surges is we create these um, community living room type spaces where that will ebb and flow throughout the day so that in the morning when there needs to be some overflow with the young families, it, nestles into the community living room and in the afternoon when there needs to be some overflow. It also helped, of uh, the tweens, that can overflow. It also helped to support how we were going to program, started thinking about programming the exterior spaces, particularly with the tweens after school. That um, is a good ebb and flow space. Um, the other thing that was really interesting when we um, talked with the tweens is you have to think about, you know, we, with the staff we talked a lot about that their traditional and conventional definitions of libraryness and their, the non-traditional definitions. And we have to really look at what folks need at that time of day when they're at the library. And for the tweens who were there after school for about an hour and a half, not, they don't necessarily need learning at that moment. They need a lot of other things <laughs> that we saw, like food and maybe tossing their backpacks around and you know being that the friendly bears to their friends. Um, although there were some who needed some quiet escape, but I think what that made us realize is that not just for the tweens, but for all of us, at different times of the day, we need different types of spaces and places and activities to be impactful and meaningful. Hey, Margaret. I'll yeah. just add, the, the issue of the tweens and the, the, the character of the library space when they're present is something that <laughs> has shown up in just about every focus group meeting that we had. I mean, it didn't matter which focus group we were in, that issue came up. What's really compelling, though, and I think what's been really touching onto some of these themes that Margaret mentioned, and the added one, the idea of being inclusive as well, was... Generally what we've heard was a, a recognition that there's a disruptive quality to the way it happens presently. And gosh, wouldn't it be great if we could do something about that? But we haven't heard, 
can you put them behind a wall so that we don't have to ever, like a, there was really a real sense and a, a, um, a commitment we felt from this community, the, the acknowledgement that it was an important part of the life in the library and that they have, a, they have as much as right to be there as anybody else. And it's a matter of trying to figure out a way to make the library work for them and for the other users as well without trying to um, pretend that, they don't, that they're not there. We wanted to focus on this a little bit just because it was fun, um, but I think it leads to, to your point about there's, we're, we learn a lot about what all of us would enjoy doing at a library, but really by focusing on this age group. I love designing for teens because we get into innovation like so fast because they will go there with their answers. <laughs> and when they say they want these, you know, the basketball and the king size bed and the taco truck, you know, what they're really telling us is we need some places for recreation, we need to eat something, and we need a place to relax, you know? So we don't have to give them the king-size bed, but we really need to kind of uncover what that means. But a place to, for recreation, a place to eat, a place to relax, I mean, who, all of us need that, you know? Um, and then, you know, better Wi-Fi, phone charging station, that's just all about being lightning fast. All of us expect that. Um, and then, I mean, this is obviously a generation that, that in the focus groups, they had their phones and their mouths were equal. I mean, <laughs> um, but the recording studio is, you know, the place to create. Um, and I was giving the example of how my son had to do a book report, an oral book report, and so he went into his closet to muffle the sound so that the, the clothes would absorb. And I was just like, gosh, why can't you just go to our local, you know, your local library to do that? But the local library didn't have a recording studio yet. So these are, these are tools that are quite useful because teachers are giving assignments, um, but all of us would enjoy. Um, and then the other thing that was fun with them, and I encourage all of you to go home tonight and draw your library, although we're going to give you that activity, was just to have them design their own library. And there were certain things that we saw particularly that round shape um, became apparent um, in a lot of the, the um, drawings. But they also recognized that on the other side of the teen area wall, there needed to be a quiet section because they, they are aware that they're disruptive um, in the library and they don't want to be. So it was an interesting um, diagnostic. The other f fun thing, um, was the light up the night, which I think was a really good time for us to be there as an um, opportunity to meet with a lot of young families who aren't as, don't have the same flexibilities in their schedules to come out to all of the focus groups. Um, so we, we learned a lot at the light up the night about what young families would want to do at the library and a lot of craft programs was their response as well. And I think over 200 people, or almost 200 people filled out surveys for us. I know y'all are just ready for the recipe. You want the recipe. The, I saw, I, sometimes I call it the great reveal. Well, the town hall, I wanted to also um, do a quick synopsis of what we learned. So in the interactive activity, everybody gathered around and became a customer persona. Um, and in that customer persona, you created a library experience um, for that individual that you were designing for. And I think one of the things that was wonderful, M Maddie churned it into these charts and graphs, don't worry about all the words, um, but I think especially when we asked the question, I was surprised that the new, at the new library I could also, just an amazing amount of activities and programs that y'all created um, for your customers. And then um, the the opportunity to make the places um, that would make your experience meaningful. Um, and the top ones that came out were, at the time, what we were calling the Vibrant Cafe. That has since changed to the Co Pleasant Hill Cozy Cafe. Um, the Messy Maker Space, the Techie Maker Space, and the Computer Lab were, were spaces that started to rise up. But we did a synopsis, and I think one of the things that we saw as the three things that we saw as major themes were that you want, a you want the library to create community. 
You want the library because you want to learn something new and you want to make cool stuff. And what we start doing with those big ideas is we start seeing what are the spaces and places that support what you want to do. So in the Create community, I mean, everybody had a cozy cafe and everybody had a community living room. Um, the learning something new starts to happen in like the tech zone and the storytelling lab and the making cool stuff in a place like a new media lab and a messy program room. And then those turn into the multitude of activities that start to activate those spaces. So this is a, a framework that we use to help turn that you can do anything, anytime that you want to do at the library into a pattern that works within a 25,000 square foot envelope. What you all said your characters, customer personas felt when they left the library was optimistic, empowered, inspired, and energized. And I wanted to bring these words up because I think they're different than the first words of striking, welcoming, comfortable, adaptable about what you want the building to be. And I think it's important, these are really powerful words and we also want to remember those through the design process because why wouldn't we want to feel this way when we left the public library? And so I love doing these little cartoons where um, a library is a gift to the community. And so you all just created experiences where, um, who, who are these characters? Sarah and Hector? Sarah and Hector are a homeschool mom and a son with special needs, and she uses the library to get more resources for her son, and her son uses the different spaces in the library to learn differently than just with a book and a textbook and pen and paper. You know, I'm sure library, librarians often get real thank you notes all, all the time. <laughs> So as we start to develop conceptual diagrams, um, this is not a building design, but we work in the world of graphic diagrams. We started to create this thesis diagram for the Pleasant Hill Library, where there's a place for community, a place for storytelling in all its vibrant forms, a place for play, a place for ideas to flourish, a place for the community to collaborate and connect and work and study. And there's also, you all own zero to five. Public libraries own zero to five. Contra Costa owns it. Pleasant Hill owns it. You flourish there. We wanted to make sure to create intentional experiences for that um, very special group that the library can really be a strong platform for early literacy and reading readiness and getting kids ready for kindergarten. And then a place for tweens. We went to... Um, Restaurant Jack's, and there's a bartender who, when he said he was in his middle school years, he went to the Pleasant Hill Library, so we learned it was a rite of passage. We did some really great workshops with the staff um, who created, also did some really deep work on creating um, customer personas so that we could really start to get into, you know, what, who are the folks that are using the library in Pleasant Hill. Um, but what we learned is that you all are a community who really loves your library, um, and so. One of the exercises, uh, this, the staff worked together in the first work group to make up stories about um, different users that they had seen in the library, and then we actually met Amir, um, not his real name, um, when we were visiting an ESL group, and the story resonated with us so much that um, these guys brought him back to the second workshop. But Amir is a retiree who's moved here um, from Iran, and he was a storyteller and an author back home, but he's in the ESL group now, um, just learning to speak English and sharing his stories with his coworkers. And so we thought um, this exercise was all about figuring out spaces and relationships that would make the, the library experience meaningful for a single user, because it's sometimes easier to think about a single user and then look at the patterns that start to mesh and not mesh between the users um, than it is to try to make a library that's all things for everybody and it becomes nothing for anybody. Um, so this is just about Amir, it's not about what's in the library. Um, but So for Amir, he goes to the library, he goes to the cozy cafe, he sees some people, he goes to the social club room, he learns to tell a story, 
Um, and then maybe six months later, when he's comfortable telling his stories in these small groups, he goes back and he shares his story across the way in the storytelling lab with a bigger group up in front of an audience like I'm doing, which is a little scary, um, especially if you're not a native English speaker. Um, and then finally, when he's really built up his confidence in this sort of community setting, he decides to go into the media lab and record his story and put it out on the web. And so it's, it's about a cycle of learning, I think, that extends through a life in the community. Any one of us can be a mirror at any age of our life. And so you see how when we do that intentional design work around an individual, then we can see how it resonates exponentially with all of the users in the community um, at different times of day, at different times in their life. Um, but it really gives value and purpose and meaning to what, what the reason for these spaces and places and the relevancy and the impact they have in your community. It's not just square feet. Um, so I'm gonna go through um, the, again, remember this is the recipe, um, the recipe that we've got in the um, program. Um, and then after we go through these spaces and places, you all will have the opportunity to design your own future perfect Pleasant Hill Library. The welcome area will welcome you in open arms. And our goal is that it feels like that striking, welcoming look and feel that you all have articulated. Um, it's got the, the folks greeting you with a smile. Um, but it also is activated by the feeling of a popular bookstore of materials that's already happening at the library. Um, but it, you know, your lucky find is right there. <laughs> and your holds. Um, and the opportunity for it also to be activated by pop-ups where, um, some of the things that some of the staff was getting really excited about was that there could be a pop-up place for like the coolest new circuitry. So there might be something happening in your messy makerspace or a STEAM program, but let's just give you a little teaser about it. Let's just give you some access and get your hands dirty in something that you might not feel as comfortable with if it was in a big, large room in a big program. And this notion of a marketplace. So right now we're, we're giving you all sorts of evocative imagery that are also gestural. Um, but the, the notion that this is a place where you can showcase not just new books and materials, but also historical artifacts that are uh, meaningful in the community, but also things that you and your community are making. So a, a library gallery um, that's celebrates the community. The Cozy Cafe is really about what's the environment that looks and feels like your third place, your choice for a third place. And the other thing that we were hearing was, you know, the, we talked a lot to the storytelling parents about what would extend your stay? Would you come earlier or stay later if the library had and they often said we would stay, come earlier and stay later if there was a place where I could just have snacks. Um, and then even today a woman spoke about how important it is after story time to have the social time with other parents and caregivers just for the connection and the support system that that's, that brings. And we had a, um, when we talked to the ESL focus groups, there was a wonderful couple and the husband was the social butterfly and the wife liked to have her reading time. And you know, they said before they come, he likes to be social with his friends and she likes to sit by the fireplace. <laughs> um, so they come with different needs, but to be social and the, this cozy cafe as a type of place is important to that. Whether it's a vendor, or whether it's self-serve, or whether it's bring it yourself, that's, that's the operational part that we don't have to decide right now, but the need to have a place for this kind of activity. The community living room, you know, that's the glue. Where, um, you know, I always talk about the community living room being the place where I know I can go to the library and I'm not worried about my 11-year-old being in one place and my 15-year-old being in another and me needing to be somewhere else. It's a place where we can all be together. 
um, the intergenerational game zone. We love this as an extension of the community living room as a place for play and gamification, um, whether it's a board game or digital game. Um, the tech zone and the entrepreneurial center. Telecommuters, um, you know, the economical, economic statistics about telecommuters and small business startups, or, or what we call the 1099s, is gonna increase exponentially. And from our programming, there was a real desire to be, for the library to be that second place, not just the third place. Um, the library programming room, storytelling lab, so the Pleasant Hill story, story Time Room, we've given the flavor of the storytelling lab for the notion that it can be an iterative space where storytelling can flourish in the future in all of its vibrant forms, but also to be the place that um, embodies the vibrancy of story time. Um, who needs a quiet room by about this time? <laughs> so the club room is designed for that space to be the quiet um, retreat, but also the place for some, we call it the club room because it's where, you know, ESL, book club, travel club, um, whatever future club starts to form, um, a place for like 15 to 20. Um, a semi-private meeting room. We can't ever have enough study rooms, and we have about six um, in your program, which is going to be phenomenal. Approximately, what are we talking square footage? Or yeah, are, you, are you talking two or three story? Um, can you give us just sure. any concept of building size? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the um, right now what we're looking at is twenty-five thousand gross square feet, mm -hmm. um, and that's based really on pr our preliminary assessment, and it's being sort of confirmed, if you will, by what we're seeing right now in the. In the program, and it might be a little bit less than that, so that's sort of the upper limit. Uh, and in terms of how many floors, whether it's one level or two, um, we really don't don't know for sure yet. There's a lot of uh, um, benefits to it being all in one level, uh, and then we have to you know think about the site conditions of what the site can support. But we're definitely hearing you know a lot of benefits operationally of having it all one level. So. Um, yeah, so, so right now that's sort of the leading candidate perhaps, but we're not going to give up considering the other options. And the messy program room, so the eco studio I think is just symbolic of the strength of the project-based programming that the present, pleasant, the, the present Pleasant Hill Library does. Um, but we also even, um, I think last night was our homeschool family gathering, the need for STEM and STEAM-based resources and support is huge, um, even in that population. But you, we also met with the maker group and learned a lot about um, the things that they would enjoy in the public library, um, even to the point of like, a fix-it station where any one of us has home repair to do and we know that we can come to the library and check out resources and get support um, and uh, you know who likes to go who likes to make stuff who's the maker learner in the audience with me so one of the things I hear is that you know we're starving our learners if we're not also creating experience-based learning, and the public library can flourish at it, and Pleasant Hill does an awesome job. Um, and we've, we've, we're calling this the messy space, and we're calling this the, the clean maker, with kind of the new media lab, um, and whether it's a recording studio or a green screen, these are, these are the equipment and tools that we're seeing currently, but all of this may change in the future. Um, equipment can change, tools can change, but we, we're creating intentional and purpose spaces for these kinds of activities. And the other thing that I think came up a bunch in the focus groups is this metaphor of the library as a gateway. And so it's, it's not about the library being your professional recording studio. Mm -hmm. It's about the library teaching you to love recording and then connecting you to the resources and the passions in the community. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's about sort of just whetting your appetite for a lot of things and then directing you um, to the right places and the right people. Mm -hmm. um, we also have space in the youth services area for fa family gathering. Um, that's the, you know, the community living room is the big hug and this is the small hug. Um, but it also is opportunity um, to have small story time um, as well as the large. Uh, and then dedicated area for early literacy, dedicated area for play. Has anyone seen the Rube Goldberg wall that the folks, how long has that been up, Patrick? A couple days. Okay. So go see the Rube Goldberg wall because this is what the space is going to be for. Um, and then also just areas dedicated to digital literacy even at a young age um, and, and constructive learning experiences around digital literacy. I think it's something all of us are struggling with, right? Um, and what that means, but we know that the library is a place and platform for that. Um, there's going to be about 500 square feet dedicated to the tween teen age group, and so we know that it'll surge and not everybody's going to fit in one space, um, but we want to have an area that's dedicated for them and honors um, who they are and is designed intentionally for them. And then, of course, we're going to have beautiful staff spaces where collaboration. I think one of the biggest shifts we're seeing as we design staff spaces for these active 21st century libraries is the need to have dedicated areas for collaboration and working to together collaboratively in addition to the transactional spaces that you know move the materials um, but some really wonderful spaces one of the things that we have been intentional in designing the outdoor spaces is you'll see extensions of what's happening inside um, and so to design spaces for outdoor making and fixin. And to the left, we've got, this is the spirit of volunteerism in the community where um, the sibling allows the younger sibling to stand up and do a silk screen. Um, but the staff, I think, is really excited about this notion of outdoor pop-up making because they can just have diff a variety of activities on a regular basis. Um, and then the bike, some bike fix-it stations. Um, and then flexible pavement that allows parking lots to turn into play spaces on any given day and time. Started thinking about the opportunities for outdoor spaces, the discovery playgrounds and the adventure playgrounds. And libraries are wonderful places where children can go um, gather their sticks and organize their sticks and gather their rocks and organize their rocks. Um, so that spirit we're starting to see captured in um, the character that we were hearing would really resonate with outdoor library space. And also, you know, in the round, storytelling in the round, I think that's just such a critical piece of our, tr our storytelling tradition. So I like the concept that we could capture that outdoors. And then, um, you know, outdoor family areas that um, can provide spaces for play and recreation. We also heard it gets hot here in the summer. <laughs> and so, c covered areas outside that feel like porch or veranda um, type spaces so that y'all can enjoy being outside even in the hottest of days. But also for the staff this morning, reiterating that if we're going to do programming outside, let's make sure we have the coverage to be the right size, you know, so that half of, half of the kids aren't under the veranda. <laughs> so I think some of you are laughing because you must have experienced that before. <laughs> so, And then the forecourt, which is all about um, just ideas that started to develop about outdoor activities and that the outdoor space could be an extension of the library, almost like a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week extension of the library. Um, and a lot of times you'll, folks will be in the parking lot at some of our libraries because the Wi-Fi, they can get Wi-Fi. But to really be intentional about come sit in a, you know, a picnic table and enjoy Wi-Fi even if the library 
isn't, building isn't open. Um, but also, the, we had all these ideas about activities that can be derived, like a pass, passport to a scavenger hunt. I'm glad you, you brought up the, the outdoor uh, side of this, too, because I was thinking as you're going through all these other functions um, and how you know, it's important for the library to be welcoming, I think that kind of starts with the outdoors and the shell of the building and its, its involvement with its environment. I think in the, in the first uh, town hall, we heard a lot of people say how they, one of the things that they really liked about Pleasant Hill was the, the tree-lined streets and it's the, the, they can feel like they're not so packed in and, and um, uh, that, that nature is a, is a natural extension of it. And I, and I think that uh, we have a, such an incredible site that um, the shell of that building needs to feel welcoming. Right now we have a, a library that uh, separates us as users from its natural surroundings. We have the wel welcoming is all in the staff and in the other users that we encounter as we go to the library. There's a thousand percent welcoming there. Um, but uh, the building needs to feel welcoming and naturally engage the beautiful environment we have there. And that's the, the first stop in the welcoming, I think, is how it engages its natural setting there. Yeah. I think the, you know, we heard a, a really strong value, um, value placed on this being a gateway um, that starts with the exterior, but it starts from the trail, um, and the other thing, the, you know, the value of sustainability and, um, and being responsible to natural resources is strong here. And then the final thing I just, I think is really critical is just to, to think about what are we looking at when we're at the library? What are the views? How do we enjoy the natural environment that is what we heard and now what I'm seeing as you know, all of a sudden you can relax and enjoy being in this region after you get out of this dense and constrained San Francisco, and then you're here and you can breathe, right? And this is what, part of that is what makes it so special. Um, I just had a quick question whether or not there have been talks about making the building environmentally friendly in terms of utilizing, I don't know, solar paneling or figuring out a way to make sure that it reduces its carbon footprint as much as possible. And hopefully that's been discussed, and if not, I think that's really important. <laughs> yeah, it's certainly been discussed. Um, we've talked about it at length at some of our, our meetings with the city so far, and so it's, um, we're definitely focusing on specific things that we can do to make the building high-performing. Um, so we're, since we're right by the creek, uh, water management is going to be a really critical issue. So um, natural filtration off the parking lot and off the building's roof is something we're certainly planning on doing as a starter. Um, there's also going to be a storm, um, stormwater retention component with possible flooding of that creek. So uh, the water management story for this project is going to be probably the most critical environmental issue that um, we're going to be addressing head on. Um, and then beyond that, you know, Cal Green, the new uh, California building code, um, is really quite stringent, right? So it was a couple years ago, LEED certification was um, a kind of big deal everybody's doing, and now Cal Green, you're essentially doing that. So um, the code is going to force us to do that, uh, which we, we typically do at BCJ anyway. That's kind of the, the bare minimum. So um, when we start specifying materials, um, we look at life cycle analysis of materials, uh, natural renewable, renewable materials as much as possible. So these are all things that we're going to focus on as we get into detailed design. You mentioned about the creek. Um, you know, we're so fortunate, I think, to have it right adjacent to that creek there, and I don't know necessarily where the footprint of the building will be, it, assuming that it's on the creek side rather than the Monticello side. Um, I think it would be great if in the outdoor space in the rear you could figure out a way to be able to really seamlessly integrate that space with what you're talking about 
with the creek in sort of a, a flowing way. So it, it feels like you're really being encompassed by that you know, natural waterway that's there. It's, it's such a great resource to have. I, I hope we're able to take advantage of that when we design that outdoor space. Yeah, the creek is definitely one of the um, really unique features of that site. And, um, you know, the, just the opportunity to, even if you don't even see the water, because you don't, probably during the summer, there's not a whole lot of water going down there. But just the greenery, the bank of greenery is one thing, and you, could, you can open up into that and have some, really qual some real quality outdoor space. Yes, I noticed uh, the only reference I saw earlier to the uh, Friends of the Library was in a slide where it says, space will be nearby. Can you tell us uh, what you're envisioning for space for Friends of the Library in terms of a, both a sales area and a work uh, sorting area, and maybe about how many uh, thousand square feet they might be asking for or you're thinking about? <laughs> Any ideas on that area? Well, we do have an enumerated program, but I have to, I have to plead ignorance right now because I can't remember every specific number. <laughs> but we do have, you know, you're not seeing all of, we're not in the weeds in this presentation, um, but we are, um, we do have space for intake and organization and for merchandising and display, so. Mm -hmm. Yep. I'm really glad you brought that up because to me, our Friends of the Library book nook is a really important part of the browsing experience um, that we offer at the library. I've spoken to so many people, including some people on our city council, who, who talk about coming to the library on a regular basis, browsing the new books, and then stepping into the book nook and finding something great there too. And with the amazing deals and the amazing selection that our friends work so hard to, to offer up, I just feel like we have to look at these things as really just an extension of that library experience where you go and you find something wonderful to read or watch or listen to. Um, and so that's, that's really one of the approaches that we're taking in thinking about that friend's bookshop. And certainly the teeny little nook that we see now, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna do our best to expand so that um, that experience of that really nice inviting marketplace um, greets you right up front. Probably a lot of people in this room are aware that um, pretty much every program that you get at the library it's free to you, it's free to everybody in the community. It's not like we take it, there's no charge, right, to, to attend a library program, those are all free things. And that is made possible uh, through the amazing hard work of our friends of the library. Um, there's a lot of friends groups throughout the county that support different libraries, and I'm just so blessed and fortunate that we have such a hardworking and generous and amazing friends group. Um, but yeah, literally every time you've got a puppet show or you've got um, an author that we invite in every time we bring books out to the schools to give away to our young readers. Uh, every sticker that goes on the hand of a kid after a story time, those are all bought by the Friends of the Library. And in turn, they're bought by you when you contribute to that or you sign up to be a member of the Friends or, um, yeah, if you, you go to the book, bookstore, so. So are y'all getting excited about what you can do? Does anybody have any... Um, any cool ideas of what they're going to do as soon as the building opens? <laughs> Celebrate. <laughs> are y'all into um, making a library right now? Um, so I have a question as to how practical <coughs> things are going to be. I mean, everything, I'm really impressed what's up there. But I'm thinking back to my early days with taking my stroller and walking down to the library. Is there going to be a place for a stroller? Um, if I want, it's raining out and I have books, I want to just put them in a drop-in. I don't want to have to get out of my car. Mm -hmm. You know, just things for the handicap, mm -hmm. things for wheelchair, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, that would be my input at this point. That type of documentation goes into the document to say, you know, the, the values of. And you'll start to see those conveniences through during the schematic design phase when you start to see spaces laid out. Um, and, you know, public libraries um, have a lot of young families that have strollers and big bags and lots of children tugging at their heels. And so, you know, we really think a lot about what is that experience like because we want it to be as convenient for everyone as possible, right? 
Uh, for a long time now, we've, we've had a general idea of where the, or at least back to last April, uh, we've had a general idea of where the library is going to be located, but we don't have any and never seen any specific information to the exact site uh, and the considerations that are, need to be made to widen the streets there. Um, when might we actually see a drawing showing the layout of the site that the county is going to provide for us. Where did, where did John go? There he is. You want to speak to that, John? In terms of the site plan, uh, showing what you're talking about, that, that, as schematic design evolves, I think in about, as to as in April and May, we'll start seeing from the architects of the design team um, some layouts of that. Um, this project also is going through an EIR process. There's a coordinated EIR with the county and Rec and Park for the whole area. And a lot of the things like how wide streets are going to be, where turn lanes are going to be, are going to come out of the studies that we're going to be doing over the next six months or so. And so um, it's, a, it's a process that goes along with the, the, the EIR people working with the county and Rec and Park and the design team. So those things will evolve. Um, but we don't really know yet. There have to, we have to do some traffic studies and some other things to understand um, exactly what the capacity needs to be, how wide streets, where bike paths go, and that sort of thing. And, but those will be happening along with at the same time as the design team is, is designing the building and the site. Any more questions? So this is actually kind of maybe a question, I don't know, to the city people or whoever, but you made mention about changing the road and perhaps even making it wider or adding additional lanes. Can anybody comment on what that's going to do to Oak Park Boulevard? Mm -hmm. Are they going to make that now a two-lane, four-lane road? Or is it going to stay the same way? Because that's going to significantly change the neighborhood in which we live. I think to, to be clear, what we're speaking about there is the, um, there's a turnout lane being proposed so that people who are turning into Monticello don't, you know, they, they can turn out into a turnout lane. Do you know what I'm saying? So that's, that makes it a little bit safer so that when people are slowing down to turn right, they have a lane to pull into. And I don't know the full extent of what the county's doing with the traffic plan. I, you know, at that point, we're, we're, we're going up to the, where the turnout lane is. I don't know how far that goes. I don't think it goes very far, but that's something that they're currently in the process of developing through their traffic study. So that's, that's kind of outside of this project. I really do, I want to, I think, on behalf of all of us who've been engaged in this first phase of this experience, um, thank you all for everything that you've contributed, your time, your ideas, um, your constructive advice, your constructive criticism, your constructive energies, um, and you all are on your way to making a library that's for you, by you, and I'm just really excited about seeing what it's going to become. So thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs>